So hi everybody, it's a pleasure having you here today and to introduce our speaker, Steve Tagg, who is here to share his insights about making great presentations. Steve received his BFA in theater from Illinois Wesleyan University and his MFA in theater from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. He has performed in and directed productions of the University of Delaware's resident ensemble players since its inaugural 2008-2009 season and with UD's professional theater training program before that. In addition, he's played numerous roles in regional theaters and Shakespeare festivals across the country. And this is not his first foray into working with scientists. He has been involved in team teaching a course here at the University of Delaware called Business, Ethics, and Communication in the Life Sciences under an NSF IGRT grant based at the Delaware Biotechnology Institute. And so with no further ado, Steve Tag. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. So I have a, a sort of three parts to this. One is a, a small um, joke, and then uh, I'll do a ni my 90-second elevator speech, and then we'll talk about the formulation of that and maybe uh, write another one either one of my own or maybe we'll write one together based on one of one of your ideas. So two atoms are walking down the road and one of them says, oh my gosh, I, I think I lost an electron. The other one says, are you sure? I'm positive. There you go. There you go. That's for you guys. All right. So um, does anybody have a, you have a stopwatch on your phone? Can you put it on? See how I do. All right. Ready? Yeah. Good. Good afternoon. About uh, five and a half years ago, I had quintuple bypass heart surgery. You know, the kind where they saw your chest open and put in some new plumbing. And if I could, I would kiss every scientist in this room because your chosen way of life saved my life. Think of the God knows how many hours scientists spent learning how to sterilize the scalpel, sharpen the saw, practicing sewing with the world's smallest needle, perfecting the super glue that held my skin together. Or consider the thousands of incremental advancements made to that complex heart and lung machine that kept me alive for three hours. So in a certain way, I am the living, walking proof that science is progress, and it gets better. I think everybody in this room should kiss a scientist, even if you kiss each other, because all of our lives are better through science. The uh, airbag, fruit in December, vaccinations, the the world in your pocket. This is not just progress. This is moral progress, true equality. For now, the poor man can be as safe, as healthy, and as happy as the rich, all thanks to science. How'd I do? Uh, minute 45. Ooh, a little long, a little long. 15 seconds long. But anyway, that's my, uh, that's my elevator speech. So let's talk about that for a moment or talk about, actually, why don't you respond to that first? Like how you liked it, what it was, if it was any good. Yeah, that's the kind of thing I was thinking about doing, etc. I just want to get my notes up here. There we are. Go. How was it? How was it? Yeah, that was pretty good. Yeah. It, it really grabbed my attention at the beginning, that's for sure. That's good. Right, right, right. Good, 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 good. How, how did it do that? Um, just like with your personal story. It's yeah. kind of scary and unique. Yeah, yeah. Kind, kind of what? Like scary and unique. Scary and unique, yeah, certainly scary for me, right. <laughs> yeah. Yes? So it uh, seemed longer because it was pretty packed with content. Yeah, good. And how, content meaning like? Um, I don't know, I guess just not much filler, just a lot of information. Gotcha. A lot of information. Got it. Great. 
Anything else? What else? Yes, sir. You had direction, because you, you, you first began with the personal story, then you talked about um, what the individual parts of that story that amazed you. Right. And then you tied it into a science as a whole, where you didn't get stuck on one particular detail. Pretty good, pretty good. Keep going. What else? You're getting, you're, you're sort of creating the outline. You're creating the outline of what we're about to talk about. So I, I'll just put some of them down. So, what a weird board. Yikes, not a great mark. Can you see that? Huh? They're all lousy. I tried the green one. It's, it's just as bad. Is there another one? Maybe I could try one of the other ones. How about this one? Oh my. God, how do they get on it? Oh, that's, that one's good. Well, never mind. So there won't be any writing. You'll just have to remember it. Um, so one is certainly the getting the attention side, and we'll talk about that a little more and how that works. The focus of the idea, I think that's number one. That's the thing we're going to talk about first. Keep going. Yes, sir? I would say it, you know, a good presentation or a good short thing always tells a story. You know, it, there's, there's a story around there that... It does. It does. Right. So that'll be a piece of what we talk about. Somebody else? More things? It's a pretty good sketch so far. Yes, ma'am? You're very calm, too, and your cadence when you're talking was, like, very... Yeah. Like, you're taking your time with it. It wasn't like you were rushing through the nine seconds. Right. Time to get to the 15th floor. Metaphorically, right? It's kind of like that. All the pacing, which is very good, it wasn't yeah. too rushed. It kind of flowed very well. Very nice. It's very nice. nice. Yeah. Some of the things that we talk about, or some of the things that you saw, we can't handle. I mean, we can't handle in 45 minutes. Do you know what I mean? Some of them we can, and those are the ones that we'll focus on. Pacing is tough. That's just difficult. You'll do the best you can in yours, but you're seeing countless hours of standing in front of classrooms, in front of audiences, in front of etc. And that's, that's hard to get in 45 minutes or however much you practice. But I think we can get far. But let, let's just look, uh, how do I get this up there so that we can, maybe it's not necessary. Let's just look at the first one. We'll just look at the first one, which is the idea. So you must have, I think this is the most important piece. If you had to say what the idea of my speech was, what would you say? Like the bottom line, the take home message. Yeah. To appreciate um, scientists. Not bad. Not bad. So whatever I did worked, because I think that's it. The, the, it, it was a sort of big thank you is what it is and to appreciate because I think we don't appreciate how much science impacts our lives every every minute every hour it's really astonishing and it really came home to me of course in the middle of that whole process of surgery Be both before during and after right so that's it so that's the idea so you must have some idea that it is that you wish to communicate and you need to refine that idea and focus it down if you can to one sentence like a thesis yes the whole thing will then revolve around that thesis or that one sentence and that th that, that sentence is like an anchor it's the thing that you hold on to like you, you when you're writing it and when you're practicing it, you keep returning to it. It's like, right, right. I want them to get, this is me, I want them to get how grateful I am to science and scientists. And I just keep returning that over and over. I'm so grateful to science and scientists. Honest to God, I am. And I kept returning to that idea over and over to keep myself true to the one single focus so that it doesn't, as someone said, split off into six different ideas. Yes? Which is true for the 90-second 90 90 elevator speech. It's true for the eight-minute TED talk or the whatever it is that you're doing. A central focus is essential. Yes? We got that one? Good. We'll return to that when we talk about 
let's do it now. Let, let's give me one idea. Give me some of your ideas. Do you have them yet? Or are you still thinking about it? Ideas about what? About what your 90-second uh, elevator speech will be. Because you're all writing them, yes? Have I got the right idea? Yeah, actually, this is mostly a class that's not participating in the competition, but they will be doing presentations. They're going to do oh. more. Uh, this is, a, little a lot longer. of these students are from my class, and they're actually going to be doing sort of more like a five minute. So they're not going to do 90 seconds, it's going to be like Perfect. a TED talk type thing. Even better. On some research project that they're working on. Fabulous. So, what is the central. So, you all are doing this. I assume the projects are going already. You're not going to start it. But they have the ideas. Fabulous. So, let's just. Put a couple ideas out on the table so we can see what the focus will be of your five minute, eight minute speech. Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Deforestation. So you'll have to say, can you frame it? So I got it, deforestation. Can you frame it in a sentence that is like an idea? Because deforestation by itself is just a sort of subject, it's not really an idea. So um, how deforestation impacts society? Good. Can you frame it in a slightly more dramatic way? Like, my, my, this is good. You're on the right path, and you'll just keep refining this. Mine was, you know, it took me, I was like, yeah, I want to write about the surgery and the science. What is it that I write? I want to communicate how grateful, that's the drama, I am for the dedication of scientists. So, the deadly effects of deforestation? <laughs> it's good. It's good. It's good. Deadly is a dramatic word, and deadly, deadly is good because it raises the drama and gets you going and gets us going as the listener. So say it one more time. The deadly effects of deforestation on society. Fabulous. Could you could you skinny it down? I don't know how much time five minutes is. Pretty fast. Maybe it's not necessary to skinny it down to one deadly effect. Can you skinny it down to three? Give me three. I haven't researched yet. You haven't done it yet. Fine, fine. So we'll just stick with the deadly effects of deforestation on mankind or humankind or the world or living things. Living things, right. So that's not a bad idea. You all understand how she has focused it down and now her five minutes, she'll keep returning to that like a mantra, you know, she'll keep returning to that, which will keep that thing very tight and focused. Good? Let's have another one. Another idea. Even if it starts as a topic like deforestation, that's a topic. It's not really an idea. Because it's so huge. Yes? Somebody? There we go. Yes, sir. So, uh, land use can land can be used to both promote sustainability and engage in sustainability. Say it one more time. So, uh, land use. Land, land use. use so, the, how we use land. Mm -hmm. Land can be used to promote and engage in sustainability. And what is sustainability like? Like, uh, help me out. Yeah. So it's like. Uh, Ensuring uh, progress for the future. So making it possible that societies of the future can exist and that we can progress to that point. I get it. I get it. So this is a one of our other piece, one of our other four pieces. We have four pieces, right? Sustainability for me, not total Martian, but a little Martian. I don't really know exactly what he means. So y'all, and I don't know if this is part of the game. It is in elevator speeches and TED Talks. And I think it's overall part of the sort of meta game that science is playing now, which is we've got to be able to communicate to regular folks. And in order to do that, we can't use our language. You can't use your, your cliques, your groups, your tribes, science language, because no one gets it outside of the tribe. You have to speak like, we call them grandma speeches, like talking to grandma, yes? So sustainability is one of those words that goes just a little bit outside the bounds of grandma. Do you know? I don't know how hip grandma is. Maybe she's super scientific. But. So just give me one more time, the, in, if you could frame it in a sentence that's not, not too long. The thesis. Uh, how can we use land to 
uh, ensure societal progress. Society's future? Yeah. Society's f yeah. Ensure yeah? is good. Ensure feels like it's got some <clears throat> in it, you know, some, some drama in it, which is good. And he narrowed it down because the first time it was pretty long and hard to hold on to. So we want the mantra to be able to, we can return to it easily. That's good. That's good. And you can hear his struggle with it, which is also good. He's like, um, because uh, he wants to say it, you know, right in a, in a potent fashion. So that's good. One more, and then we'll move on. Give me one more idea, just so that you're well practiced at honing it. Easy, easy, you guys. It's overwhelming. Somebody? One more. Yeah, I'll do a more Thank specific you, one on a research project. Beautiful. So, um, how safe are soils in the state of Delaware that have had um, lead arsenic, which is a known carcinogen, applied to them? Great. One more time, and can you... It's best... One of the things that is sort of a tried and true um, method for acquiring a thesis is ask a question like that and then answer it. Then the answer is the thesis, not the question. Yes? So can you answer that and make an assertion? Maybe? Um, sure. So um, soils within the state of Delaware, which have um, had lead arsenate pesticide applied to them previously could pose risks to Delaware citizens. Not bad. Can you make it a little more dramatic? You don't have to, you know, by making it dramatic, we don't necessarily want to be inflammatory or fake because people will smell that. So you can't just trump it up to be jazzy, right? It has to be real and maybe the drama is, is subtle. It's not huge and that's okay. So just take another shot at it. All right. The effects of lead arsenate application, and this was in the early 1900s, yeah. um, could pose risk to um, Delaware citizens as a known carcinogen. What can we do to ensure that that doesn't happen? Does that... It does. I, I get it. I get it. If, if I were to monkey with a little bit, it would be something like, uh, dangerous levels of lead arsenate. I'd fix that because lead arsenate's weird. Can we just say lead? Arsenic, great. Arsenic's even better because we know that's scary, right? Um, dangerous levels of arsenic have been found in the soil of Delaware. Is that enough? Should we just leave it there? Dangerous levels of arsenic have been found in levels in the, so the, let's leave it there. Dangerous levels of arsenic have been found in the soil of Delaware, which is not a bad, not a bad thesis. That's your assertion or that's your concern. So here's the second part of it, right? So we've got three ideas and we'll come back to all three of them. Let's stick with this one for just a second. So what she has an action now. We call it an action in the theater. You can call it something else. You can call it an intention, right? What is her implied intention in that speech? What's it going to be, do you suppose? Like she, it, it has a purpose. Her speech will have a purpose. She's not just talking to hear herself talk, right? My speech had a purpose. It wasn't just talking to hear myself talk. What will be her purpose or what is my purpose? You could say, what is her action? What will her action be? What was my action? And we could list some actions if maybe that's easier. Why do people talk? Um, <coughs> to display the facts. To, to inform and display the facts. That's one reason people talk. To educate and persuade. To educate and persuade. Educate is similar to display the facts and to inform. To persuade is different, right? You're not just, I'm putting out the facts, do with them what you will. It's, mm -hmm, come on over here. Yep. To inspire, to inspire. To inspire is great. Yes? 
express opinion. To express an opinion, and we usually express an opinion not like, I need to express my opinion. It's, I'm expressing my opinion because uh, I want to get you over here, usually. So it's usually to persuade. More? To cooperate with other people. Sure, to create cooperation. Yeah, that's nice. That's a good one. Yes, keep going. Mine was to thank. To thank or to admire is a reasonable action that we do in life. Yes, we do that. To show our thanks, to give thanks. Yes? So what would hers be? Well, I don't think we've said it yet. Because it's a reasonable action for a speech of five minutes. Sounds like it could be a cautionary tale. So to frame it in the infinitive would be it's to warn. warn. Exactly. It's to warn or to caution, which is, that's a great thing to do. That, that's, we, we do that all the time. That's a great service. So she's got the idea. She's got the action, right? That's the, that's the, the style of it, if you will. So it's all going to have that feel of, I'm warning you now. Th this is a possibility in our future in the state of Delaware, right? Which is great. Um, so we've got the idea. We've got the style of the action. She'll put it, we've already touched on this one, she'll put it in the language that is for grandma, right? We can talk a little bit more about that one. So one of the things I think which is super um, accessible, makes a speech accessible, is metaphor and simile. So if you can find one of those, they're like gold. It's the thing where we go in the audience, oh, now I understand what she's talking about. Ah, I get it, right? The little bulb goes off. You say, you see, it's like a, I was watching this thing. What was it about? It was about, um, you guys might know this. I don't know how oriented you are around genetics. But this woman is explaining, this is way over my head. And then she says, it's like this machine, I can't remember what the machine was, probably some kind of gene sequencer, is like a word processing machine. I was like, okay, good. I know what that is, right? I have one of those. And she said, this machine allows you to cut and paste. I was like, I got it. I got it. I understand that machine now. I can cut and I can put it over here. And so I guess that's what they do with this genetic material. The little, I don't know what, the denizens and then and they move it over here. Yes, right? I was like, I got it. Or the X's and Q's and R's, whatever they are. So uh, metaphor and simile is very powerful and very helpful. And if you have five minutes, you certainly have room. It's hard to squeeze it in 90 seconds. Um, what else is true about, let's see if I'm missing anything here. Right. Yeah, that's right. Test it. Test it on someone. I didn't. I didn't do that. I could have. I, I was tempted to test it on my uh, class that I had this afternoon, but we got squeezed in time and I sort of forgot. I was like, oh, damn, I didn't test my speech because I like to test them on the students. And I go, can you follow it? Yeah, it's like, about. no, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, which is, is a good thing to do. Not only does it get your nerves up, right? Because you have to do it in front of somebody else and that's a really good thing to practice it. Practice is probably the best thing you can do for yourself to calm the nerves, but to get the nerves up you find out where you stumble and where the hard parts are, right? But test it on someone for clarity ab uh, uh, above anything else, yes? That make sense? Great. Right, so we've got the action, we've got the plain language, we've got the major idea, the only le thing left is the personal part, right? So there must be something that you do in your piece that invites us in. And there are a lot of ways to do that, and they're not really tricks. I mean, you can look at them as tricks if you like. If you focus on them as tricks, they tend to get a little slimy, though. 
I think really it's part of the motivation to communicate with another human being. So I use story, right, a personal story, personal revelation, and you don't have to do that. There are many other ways to do it, all of which fall under the umbrella of an invitation. Give them some reason to listen to you for that period of time, for that five minutes, right? And mine was, she said, a, a sort of interesting, scary story. Uh, that was my little way to get into you, to, to get a hold of you, to grab your attention. I hate to say it that way, grab your attention, because that makes it start to sound cheap. But if that's what it is, yeah. I guess I would say it more than it why it relates to the person. You know, the hook is sort of to make it relate to you, why you care about it. That's it. Why you care about it. That's it. That's it. Give us a reason to care. That's it. Give us a reason to care. So that's where the, they're all hooked into the idea, yes? You must believe in your idea. If you don't, you're sunk. You're sunk. Nothing will happen if you don't believe in the worth of your idea you're just going to have to fake it or get another idea. Seriously, I mean, that, that, that's really the key. You must, and I, I assume you do, or you wouldn't have chosen the thing that you chose, you must believe in it to some degree. That, and maybe the M.O. is, maybe the M.O. is to clear up a misunderstanding. Maybe that's the action. That's a common action. There's a misunderstanding in society, in, in, among this demographic. I'm going to clear up this misunderstanding. That's a great thing, right? Maybe land use, maybe that is the MO of that one. Or maybe it's the arsenic, right? Which is, uh, maybe it's not to warn, which sounds a little confronting or confrontational. Maybe it really is to... to to bring something to light. That sounds better than worn. You're bringing it to light. Yeah? So that's it. Those are the four pieces. Focus your idea. Keep it in a language that grandma can understand. Make it personal or create some kind of invitation. Give me a reason to listen. And an action. F keep, keep, have a clear action for the speech which will keep it organized. That and the idea, keep it organized. Good? Any questions? I'm done. Thank you, Bob. Ah. So we can now talk. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Uh, a little bit about, I mean, you're so compelling because also your eye contact and mm. the way you help yourself and the mm. way you relate it to this mm. entire room. Mm. Do you have tips on all of that? I do, and it's going to sound squirrely. Okay? It's going to sound squirrely, but here's what it is. Love. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I, I don't know exactly how you will do this. It is to love the people that you're speaking to. I know it sounds weird, but I mean that to say that I, let's make it a little less weird, um, that I appreciate, let's say that, because that's a little more, uh, not quite so woo-woo, right? I appreciate this young woman. I appreciate that young man as a human being who's taken the time to sit here and listen to me. That's generous of them. You've all been generous to give me your attention, and your attention has been largely undivided, which is great. That's a great thing. I don't deserve that particularly, right? You give that willingly, like a gift. And that makes me grateful. And that's what I mean when I say that's when it gets, for me, connected to love. I, I'll say this, right? Love the people in this room as I'm speaking. It's a, the, the what's going on right here is a generous act. I'm not being stingy and neither are you. We're both being very generous. And that's a 
great thing. You want me to win. You don't want me to suck. You don't want me to fail. You don't want any of those things because it would be terrible, right? It's not like a football game where you want the Yankees to lose, or not the Yankees, the, <laughs> the Bears, the, the, Giants. the Giants, where you want the Giants to lose or the Yankees to lose, right? It's different. You, you wanted me to win, and that's a great thing. Not so easy to remember when you're coming up here because it looks like you're being evaluated, judged. It it's, feels awful. You got all these eyeballs on you, and it can look like threat. I get that. You know that whole thing, right? People fear death more than public speaking. Uh, sorry, public speaking more than death. And that's like for real. They do a poll, right? And they, I don't know how they do the poll, right? And they ask you uh, like 12 different questions. And the results are, this person would rather die. They're less afraid of death than they are of public speaking, which is crazy. I mean, that's crazy, but that's how it is. So I understand that. I understand that. If you can orient yourself around they, meaning the audience, want you to win, he will want you to win. He doesn't want you to fail, even though he's grading you. Yes? That's how we are. It's just not easy to remember that the teachers want you to succeed. Right? So that's it for me. That, I know part of it's a little, but that's it. Yeah? I mentioned to, to my class, and it's been, I've noticed this, that some of the speakers that I've seen over my life who are really good had some type of theater background. Uh, so I'm interested from your perspective of what, you know, in courses you teach or what you bring from your, what, what are the characteristics that people bring with that background that make their presentations, that's, yeah, that's you know, really good. Because I think there's some, and it's beyond, I think there are intangibles like, you know, Debbie was saying, there, there are things that they bring in terms of how they go about making the presentation. Yeah. You know, there's content, but there's also, I assume you bring delivery things that come from a theater background. There. Right, and that's the thing I sort of touched on when they were speaking of pace, right? That, that well, I know you learned that, but what are the things people should be thinking about? Sure, so, so it's, uh, they're the four, the four pace, power, pitch, and quality. Those are the things, those are the four quick, easy things that we talk about all the time. So pace, how quickly are you speaking, and can we stay with the speaking? The power, is it loud enough that, we can, that you can hear, right? Some people, even in a room this small, you can, you're like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you know, I, I, you can't hear them. Um, power, pitch, uh, um, pitch, right, that your voice is modulated in a way that is attractive, that's tough. That's tough to get, right? All of these are hard to get. And finally, the quality. The quality of the speech or the quality of the voice is pleasant. All four of those take a lifetime to work on. You know, you, you can be attentive to them, I think, but honestly, I wouldn't give it a thought. It's, it will just make you self-conscious in a way that you don't want to be self-conscious. You're fine. You're fine. I, I wouldn't spend much time on that. It's, it's, it's too huge. Too huge. Yes, sir. Do you learn from what? I mean, this is beyond this class, but I know I've learned a lot from you say you shouldn't think about those, which I understand what you're saying, but what about watching yourself do that at some point? Yeah, I, I think for this, I mean, it depends on your path. Let, let's say you have a path that includes a lot of potential. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, most of these students are going to go out and as a lot of them, they're engineers, and they're actually going to have to make presentations, and they're going to have to, they're going to have to convince people to hire their company, and, and it's really important at times. Then you may be on a path where this will be a piece of your life for a long time, and it might be worth investing in some practice along those lines, right? That can come in about a million different forms, yes? That can come in the form of, I know this is going to sound stupid, Exercise. A human body that is exercised is just more, it's got more oomph, right, than, than the noodle that never does anything. I mean, the noodle has to have massive willpower to be vibrant, yes? Whereas that's why if you've seen athletes in my classes, and I'm not saying anything against scientists, love scientists, 
in my classes, I would take, they're a little obnoxious, but I would take 12 athletes over 12, I'm not saying this, I don't mean anything, honor students, right? The honor students are so, I got to get it right. They're so, they're like, I'm going to get it right. <laughs> they get up and they're like, um, they're so smart, but they're so overachievy and tight, right? Whereas the athletes are like, they're used to being yelled at, right? People yell at them all the time, and like, get your ass over here. I'm like, yeah, all right, what? What do you want me to do? I say, can you just be louder? Why are you so, why are you so quiet? Just be loud. I'm like, okay, okay, I'll be loud. And you can, it's like, they just have, and I think it's not just because of the coaching, it's because they're in their bodies, which is a great thing. Right? Which actors are in their bodies. They're not outside of their bodies like some people are. And that's okay. They're doing fine. They're going to have kids and long lives and stuff, right? But for presentations, it's not so bad. So just exercise this is a great thing. It makes your voice great, makes your lungs great. Swimming, it's fabulous, fabulous, right? Um, and you can. There are lots of other things you can do. Look at other, yes, if you're going to do this a lot, watch yourself. Watch yourself. Scary. Scary. If you don't plan to do this a lot, don't bother. Because it's horrible. It's horrible, right? But if you think, yeah, exactly. Whew. Yep. But if you plan to do this a fair amount, which that seems to be the national sort of movement that science has just got to get out and make it happen. They've got to get the money. They've got to get the public approval. They've got to get the corporate approval. They've got to get all this stuff, and they can't do it just sitting in their lab. They have, that's why I'm part of this Eigert class, because Kelvin, for two reasons, he felt that the presentation communication skills were weak, number one, and number two, which is the part that's a little more interesting to me, is he wanted them to be, and I say this gently, humanized. They want, so every day, every class, we contemplate what I call contemplate something beautiful. We look at something beautiful and we talk about it, which is outside the box that they're accustomed to thinking in because there's no particular right and wrong when one is contemplating something beautiful. Yes? There's no the solution. Um, how did I get on that tangent? I have no idea. More questions? Yes, ma'am. Can you give some tips for people who are stage fright or especially nervous on yeah. calming themselves and um, maybe what to do if you suddenly forget your lines, so yeah. to speak? Yeah, practice. Honest to God, it's such a boring answer. Practice, 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 practice. What, why do you think, I know, yeah, sure, but why do you think that guy takes Thousands and thousands of hut. <laughs> Step back, three steps. Huh. I mean, he's been doing that since he was eight. Does he really need to keep practicing that? Yes, because you have a 280-pound human being coming at you at 50 miles an hour who's going to really hurt you if you don't get it right. So the nerves must be incredibly high. So they do it over and over and over, thousands and thousands of times. It really is the key. It, it, you know, on stage, you practice a lot and things still go wrong, but because of the practice, it tends to fall back into a groove, and that's what you want, because you're going to mess up. You're just going to mess up. That's highly, highly likely. And if there's a groove, kind of like a record, you know, even when you screw up, you pause for a second, <laughs> you enjoy, you know, you're embarrassed or whatever, and then it, whoop, it slips back into that groove because you've practiced it so much. I promise that's the best remedy to nerves. So if you're super nervous, that. Then, yes, there are other things you can do. There, exercise, again. It has a physiological impact on your body that, that remedies things like high nerves, you know, and it increases your breath capacity and your VO2 uptake and all that other stuff, yeah? Prevents fainting from locking knees. I'm 
kidding. What else? Other things? Other questions? We have plenty more time. If you have more, if you want to dis if you want to. We actually normally, uh, normally end at a quarter two, so you don't have to stretch it out too much. Oh, fine, fine, <laughs> fine, there you go. So is, is there anything else you want to talk about? Anything you want to ask? Is some, something you want to practice? Something you want to know about the speech that I did or me or anything? Yeah. Like a Facebook or website or something? Uh, no, I don't have either of those things. Kind of a dinosaur. So how do you get, like, how do you mark yourself? I don't. <laughs> I don't. How do you end up in this room? Uh, that's Beth, I think. I don't know how she found me. Through Anne? Um, so, well, I'm, I'm a season ticket holder at the rep. Oh, uh, nice. There you go. <laughs> and, um, and I did hear from our, I guess she's the Deputy Provost for Graduate Professional Studies and Artists at the university, that he had been doing this work with, with the class, right. um, the Ibert program. Right. And um, it was her suggestion that you know this would work really well for our Pitch 90 competition, which yeah. I don't know if you guys have heard too much about that, but um, but it's it's for uh, there's a common misconception I think that it's only for graduate students who are doing research, but it is open to undergrads. <coughs> if, if you've done some research, it's a thing that you can give a try. We do it every year in November. Right. It's a cool, it sounds like a cool thing. 90 seconds to communicate your idea that you've dedicated. Science, oh, why your research see. matters yeah. is the question right. we want to hear from you. Right. Right. And, and the top prize is $500. Oh. Wow. It could be the best 90 seconds of your life. <laughs> the most monetarily rewarding. Right. right. 90 seconds, how much is that an hour? That's a lot. Right. Um, for me, just a sort of biographical thing, I, I am, if maybe apropos to this, I'm sort of a chunk of my life is now dedicated to the interface of art and science. That's why I'm here. It's why I'm fascinated by it. I, I don't, uh, I mean, I understand the division. I am just not a fan of the division and doing all I can to unite them because they are chasing the same thing on different avenues, which is a kind of truth, you know, and that, that's the fascinating part of science and the scientific method, is its, its pursuit of truth. And while art is not exactly in pursuit of truth, it embodies truth. It presents a possible truth. And those two together, what at the higher levels of science and the higher levels of art, they seem to me to be married, and I'm very much interested in that, uh, in promoting that. Uh, I'm not so interested in the division of these two things. They seem quite divided now, unfortunately. So either through funding or through culture or through ideas, yeah? I can, I'm happy to make that little, the four pieces available to, I can post it somewhere, I can send it to him, I can send it to Beth, however, if you want further access to that thing, I know they're recording this for... We're going to post this on the um, Delaware Environmental Institute website and the EPSCORE program YouTube channel, there'll be a link on, on our website Great. to get to it. There you go. So maybe and that's... Put, put them however you like. If you, if you send me a note and say, yeah, we do want the written version, I'm happy to send it to you. And it's just stuff that I've gathered from my own life and from, you know, there are oodles and oodles of how to give a TED Talk um, YouTube videos. They're great. Some of them are, I mean, there are so many of them now that some of them are not great. But if you go sort of back to the source, back to the guy who's like the curator of TED Talks, I can't remember his name, terrific, terrific. And there are a couple of others that are really great. People that have studied them and studied the success, what makes them successful. And those are, those are great. So they're better than I am. You could just watch the real thing instead of me. Right. Anything else? I have one more question. I think a common question with the Pitch 90 
participants in particular with such a time constraint is whether they should, you know, memorize everything word for word or just kind of have a general outline. Memorize so it. what they want to say. Yeah. Memorize it. Yeah. Re really close. Really, really, really close to fully memorized. I, I memorized mine as much as I could. I had a little, I skipped one little chunk that I wanted to put in one sentence, but otherwise I was on a little slow because I had timed myself a couple times out to 90 seconds, so I must have been a little slow. Um, but uh, yeah, memorized if it's a 90 second one. And if it's the five minute version, pretty damn close, right? Why? Because no one wants to see this, right? If you, no, no one really wants to see this. 60% of this, 50% of this, and 50% of that, not so fun. Not so fun, right? So keep the percentage like 80% of it is this, and maybe 20% is that. So I don't know how you, if I've seen people do it with their phone, with their iPad, I use my iPad in class and my iPad mini, and so I'm, I've got that thing, my notes, right, and 10%, uh, 20% of the time I'm down there remembering where I was and I'm back with you. Yeah. I should rephrase that a little bit better, because oh. I don't necessarily mean looking down at a sheet of paper, but you know, knowing exactly word for word what you want to say versus having it kind of loosely in your mind what you want to say that you have some room for, for moving around. Yeah, if it's 90 seconds, memorize it. Yeah, I think so because you could burn through 30 seconds and I don't know if they are going to put it, you know, eh, you're done. They do. Oh, they do. <laughs> Whoo! So definitely memorize it then. Definitely. And you want to practice the living crap out of that thing so you don't get bleed. You don't get to the conclusion 90 seconds it gets cut off. Man. Whew, there you not, go. That's not good for your brief. I would definitely practice and I would write it to be about 80 seconds because you know you're going to be, you're, you're gonna, something's gonna happen. You're gonna have a little word burger, something's gonna happen, and you know, suddenly 80 seconds will be 90 seconds, right? Even if some of you are prone, which many of you are on the East Coast, to speeding up in public, right? That's a common thing out here. We speed up rather than slow down. In the Midwest, we slow down. Everything's really slow in the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> we had Good. someone look up um, about an average case, yeah. if you're going to write it word for word before you memorize it, it's about 180 uh -huh. words per minute uh -huh. at an average case. Yes. I mean, you would adjust for up or down for your particular speaking style. Yeah. So, so That's people, will, you know, we told our, um, our contestants 270 words is all you need. So you need and then if you want to go less, that gives you that flexibility. Perfect. Too. Perfect. Good. Yes, sir. I guess like what's the best way, if you're memorizing something, to not sound like you've memorized it verbatim and yeah. you're just rambling? That's a really fabulous question because I noticed in my own, when I was memorizing mine and practicing it, right, I would practice it to the, don't sit in a chair and don't do it in your head, right? Don't go, mm, good afternoon. Mm -hmm. yeah, I have heart surgery for years ago, right? That's in my head, right? That doesn't work. Right? And you can't sit in your chair either. Good afternoon. <laughs> Five years ago, I had heart surgery. <laughs> it doesn't work either. You have to stand up and you have to pretend that there are people. I actually got caught by one of my colleagues this morning. He's standing in the doorway. I finished my little speech. I'm like, he's like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm just practicing this elevated speech. He said, wow, you look kind of nutty because I was looking at a painting. Right? He thought I was <laughs> praying to the painting or something. I don't know what he thought. But anyway, so yeah, you know, you got to practice. You got to get up on your feet, practice like you're talking to real human beings. And here's the key part. Here's the part that I missed for a little while was mine sounded like a speech. And I didn't want it to sound like a speech. I wanted it to sound like I was talking to you. And so I had to make a, I had to keep listening to myself and going, don't be so speechy. Don't be so speechy. I kept telling myself, don't be, just talk to somebody. Just talk. It's like five and a half years ago, I had heart surgery. And you know, it's that thing where they saw your chest open, they put in some new plumbing, right? I had to pretend I was talking to her, to a real person, not five and a half years ago, I had heart surgery, uh -huh, like I did a speech. You know, you have to pretend it's like your friend. Pretend it's your friend, you're talking to your friend, like you're hanging out with your friend, like, yeah. I mean, this guy had this, you know, this thing that's called heart surgery, and it was, uh, put some stuff in there, right? You have to, and you can mess, part of messing around, I do that, is to mess around so that I feel like it's my friend. 
I don't do the speech like that, but I do it to feel like it's my friend. Does that make sense? So it doesn't feel like la 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 la. Good. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Denis, you're welcome. Super, super pleasure. You guys were great. Thank you. Really fun. Thanks a lot, you guys.